Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome back to St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary, and I'm happy to introduce for the first time this Introduction to Biblical Studies course. Now this class is not the same as the pre-theology or college seminary introductions we teach to new seminarians, which deal mainly with the substance of the Bible. What are the various eras of biblical history? What are the different biblical books and what are they about? This course, rather, is about the procedures we use when studying the Bible and the doctrinal principles that make those procedures sound. At the risk of oversimplifying matters, let's look at a particularly important New Testament text about the authority of sacred scripture. This comes from 2 Timothy. But you, Timothy, says St. Paul, remain faithful to what you have learned and believed, because you know from whom you learned it, and that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are capable of giving you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This seems simple at first glance, but upon a little reflection, there's a little bit of ambiguity here. You can see some possible questions that we can ask here, these unresolved questions. Which texts precisely are the sacred scriptures that Timothy knew from infancy? That gets into what later theologians would call canonicity, what makes a text part of the biblical canon. Moreover, we saw in the verse the sacred scriptures. The translation says the sacred scriptures. You have known the sacred scriptures. But if you look at the Greek text, which you can see on your screen, you see those two square brackets preceded by a hollow circle. That tells you that in some of the more important ancient manuscripts of 2 Timothy, that definite article, that the, is not in the text. So this provokes the question, which text is authoritative? If I've got two different manuscripts that don't agree with each other, which text should prevail? That gets into what later biblical exegetes would call textual criticism. Moreover, Paul says, the sacred scriptures are capable of giving wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. How do the texts that compose what today we would call the Old Testament tell us about Jesus, who's narrated in the New Testament? So this gets into the relationship between the two Testaments or what later theologians would call the literal and spiritual senses. Of course, we see here, Paul says that scripture is inspired by God, literally God breathed, theopneustos. What do we mean by inspiration? And if we say that God has inspired the text, what truth claims does that allow us to make about the text as it stands? And that gets into the question of inerrancy or the truth conveyed by sacred scripture. And then finally, how are these texts useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness? And that gets into methodology. These six things, canonicity, text, Old Testament, New Testament relationship, inspiration, inerrancy slash truth, and methodology, we're going to go in depth all semester into these six concepts. We're gonna learn exactly what does the church teach about these six things, and to what extent does the church teach about these six things? And given what we know about these six things, how do we go about interpreting the Bible and making well-reasoned, faithful judgments about sacred scripture in our lives, eventually, Lord willing, as priests, but also as theologians, or just as good Catholic thinkers? Therefore, our class is going to proceed in three parts. The first two sessions, and you can see the schedule on your screen, the first of the three parts will deal with just foundations. What is the Bible? What is the biblical canon? And we'll speak a good bit about the world of the Bible. We'll do a little bit of biblical history and geography. Then we're gonna to move to the heuristic part. That is, we're going to learn by doing. We're going to look at 2,000 years of interpretation of the Bible, including both great saints, as well as some, what we might think of as villains of church history, we're going to look at the questions posed by different ages and see how the church's collective wisdom, the collective thought of the church, has crystallized on these six main concepts. Canon, text, inspiration, inerrancy, Old and New Testament relationship, and methodology. And then in the last part of the class, we'll look at how to put it into practice. 
For most, if not all of you, this course will be your first true theology class in seminary. This will be the first time where you're taking a detailed look at systematic categories, complex theological questions, seeing how different thinkers, and I'm, by that I mean different saints even, have had different ideas about what to think about some doctrinal principle. And we'll look and see how has the magisterium intervened. And then sometimes, when has the magisterium left questions opened? I want you to think through this semester with these three questions. And they generally explain why scholars disagree on all sorts of things. The first question is, what is it that we think that we're doing when we're interpreting the Bible? This is a question fundamentally about hermeneutics, about interpretation. What do we understand ourselves to be doing when we're studying the Bible? Sometimes we'll have disagreements, other times we'll generally be on the same page with that. Even when we agree on this first and most important question, we then have to proceed to big question number two, which is what tools help us do this job? Even assuming that we fundamentally agree on this first question, we then proceed to question number two. What tools help us do this job? We agree on what it is we think we're doing, but what tools help us do it effectively? Those are questions about methodology. What methodological tools are useful and helpful and why? And then finally, when we apply these principles to specific biblical texts, like we were looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, when we're addressing that question of, is the word the in that verse or not, and does it matter? Then we proceed to big question number three, judgment. What conclusions does the evidence in fact favor? And keep in mind, sometimes evidence can point in different directions. Not every question is black and white. Some questions are genuinely difficult because there's good evidence on both sides. So what I want you to see is that the magisterium has said a good bit about question number one. As Catholics, we have some pretty firm convictions about big question number one, what it is we think we're doing. The magisterium has said less, but still a decent amount about big question number two, about what tools are helpful. We're gonna see the magisterium has said that certain tools are indispensable. There are certain methodological tools we must use. But the church has also favorably evaluated some other methodological tools. But even when we agree on big questions one and two, when we apply them to a concrete case and we go to big question three, what conclusions does the evidence favor? Two perfectly faithful and intelligent scholars can reach contrary conclusions. This is commonly true, not just in biblical studies, it's true in theology and in pastoral practice in general. So what I hope you see is that this course will not just provide a good introduction to your future biblical courses, your upper level biblical courses you'll take later in seminary, but this course will also help you learn to think like a theologian or think like a pastor or think like an administrator. All of these different roles we play as priests or as other leaders in the church who have to take doctrinal principles, abstract principles, and apply them to often complex fact patterns. This is what I call forming a habitus exegeticus, or a habitus theologicus, the habit of being an exegete, or the habit of being a theologian. It's like growing in virtue. As we go through this course, one of the things you'll see is that I favor a flipped classroom approach, such that I don't tend to lecture in the classroom. I reserve class time for active debate, discussion, the stuff that we can only do when we're all together in one place. Most of the lecture is gonna occur instead in little 10 minute YouTube videos that I post here on my channel. You'll watch one of them each week before you do the reading. Indeed, the methodology of my class, you can see, has three parts. You watch my lecture, then you do the assigned readings, and this should take two or three hours, hopefully not much more each week. I've tried to keep things relatively confined, though we all read at different paces. But then when you come to class, you're gonna be expected to participate. I'm gonna call on everyone. Whether, whether you wanna share or not, you're going to be called on and I'm going to be asking you to summarize or theorize about, opine on, or interpret what you've read. What I want you to see is that interpreting the church's history and tradition and interpreting scripture is not always so straightforward. Not every question has a black or white answer, but that doesn't mean that truth is elusive.
If you're curious in these final weeks of the summer how you can prepare for class, here's a good list of things you'll want to review before the first day of class. Again, this is not a reprise of pre-theology or college seminary introductory Bible classes. I assume you already know what the Catechism teaches on the Bible. I assume you know the basics about the Second Vatican Council. You had a class on Vatican Council too. I assume that these basic eras of biblical history are familiar to you, and if they're not, feel free to check out my YouTube channel for my pre-theology class where I discuss all of these eras in order. I also assume you know the basic outline of the major parts of the canon. I look forward to having you in class this semester. As we enter into the study of sacred scripture, let us all read well and pray well.